What is up, Chiefs Kingdom? Welcome in to yet another episode of the Kingdom Crew Podcast. I am your host, Josh Fan of ShowMeFootball.com and ArrowheadAddict.com. Today, I'm joined by my co-host, as always, the Michael Darcy of KC Sports Report and Bleach Report. Michael, it is great to have you back on yet again for another week. And I'm really excited about this episode because we've got some fun stuff in store for everybody. We're going to be hosting our very own Kingdom Crew podcast mock draft on the show. Um, and then we're just going to touch on some of the latest Chiefs news and just kind of our thoughts heading into draft week. It's finally here, Michael. The NFL draft this offseason has really flown by so far. Free agency went by in a blur, and now here we are at the NFL draft, and the Kansas City Chiefs will be adding some new players um, a week from now. So how are you feeling, man? I'm feeling great. You know, the NFL draft is always the time to, you know, reinvent your team, get more players that are going to help contribute an upcoming season. And the Chiefs are a few pieces away from being right back in the Super Bowl and, and right back on that quest of trying to win three championships in a row. And really, there's only a couple glaring needs that the Chiefs have, but it's important that they hit on those needs. And there is no better time to do that than the draft. We're getting cheap talent you know, that can be on this team for the foreseeable future. And so that's why this week is so important. And, you know, Brett Veach has done a great job in years – you know, years pre, uh, previously of getting guys that have stepped up right away and played on a championship caliber team and started right away. Like that team that won the Super Bowl against the Eagles was essentially all rookies. So the fact that, you know, we have an opportunity to get, gain more players on this team, it's a great thing. Yeah, and it's an important time because – Let's be honest, and I don't mean to start the podcast off on like a controversial note, but Brian Fee just kind of left this team with quite a bit of holes heading into the draft. I mean, free agency, they went and they grabbed Hollywood Brown at wide receiver, and that was a big one. But besides that, they have not done much to address the needs or to address weaknesses from last year with players from outside of the organization. There just hasn't been much from outside the organization. And I'm not saying that as like a knock on Brett Veach or trying to play. I'm not trying to start that conversation, but you know, Hollywood Brown has been the only true difference, the only needle moving signing from outside of the organization so far. I mean, am I, am I missing anybody, Michael? That's kind of about it. it. Yeah. I mean, Josh, it's hard for me to be too upset with running it back with the guys we have. I understand you could have mm -hmm. upgraded, but they've also won back-to-back -back Super Bowls, so clearly they're doing something right, but I, I do think they could have made adjustments and brought in players that could have upgraded at those positions, but I, listen, I, I know it's cliche, but in Brett Veach, you trust, and I, I've got a lot of trust in him and his mm -hmm. plan, and it's worked out so far, but they definitely could have upgraded at some of the positions, but hey, that's maybe why they're you know going into this NFL draft looking for players that can you know, step in and contribute, and maybe that's what they're going to do in the draft. Yeah, and, and that's fine, and I, I do have quite a bit of faith in this front office and their ability to draft, but Brett Veach has done this a few times now where he just kind of relies on the draft to fill those holes, and look, to his credit, it's, it's worked out so far. He's done a great job in the past several drafts of really bringing in contributors, guys that can contribute or can contribute in year one, like George Karloftis and Trent McDuffie and that draft class a couple years ago. And then last year they were able to find some contributors. Um, so it's not that I don't have faith in this front office, but you look around this team really needs a defensive tackle they or a defensive end, maybe, maybe both. They really need a running back. They probably need another wide receiver. They need an offensive tackle. And so that's a lot of needs and you know, it's not always a guarantee that every single draft pick is going to be a hit, which is why this draft is so important. I'm really going to be uh, interested to see what kind of floor and of course, what kind of ceiling that uh, these prospects have that the chiefs decide to bring in a week from now. You know, and I, I think Brett Veach said that there was 18 first round uh, or player grades that they graded out as 18 first round players. And a lot of fans freaked out that that's not enough. and that That's about the norm. Going? Yeah, I feel like that's 
pretty much the standard, so to speak. And uh, I, I don't think that the first round is really anything that the Chiefs are putting too much of an emphasis on because most of the players that they find who are main contributors on this team come in the second, third, and fourth rounds, or at least it has been historically. So when you're picking 32, uh, I'm not really worried about, you know, who you're going to get in the first round when it's really what happens in the later rounds that has made or broke this team recently. For sure. And the late rounds, hey, this team could probably use another cornerback as well. And Brett Veach has been good at finding those late round cornerbacks. But we'll get into uh, what this team needs. I want to touch on some little tidbits that we got over the past little bit. So I guess kind of a Rasheed Rice update, if you will. Um, not much has changed on the legal front. However, Rasheed Rice, it did come out that one of the families uh, that were a victim of the accident caused by Rasheed Rice, are they're suing him for $1 million for damages. I don't know if you saw that, Michael. So yeah. that is happening, which, I mean, that's kind of something we expected. We talked about that last episode about how these legal fees are coming for Rasheed Rice and Look, he may have sacrificed his entire rookie contract from this ordeal, and hopefully he learns his lesson from it. But Andy Reid was able to talk about Rasheed Rice. He said that the team has spoken to him. They're going to kind of use this as a learning moment, um, which is a pretty good indication that he's going to be on the team next year. And, and just in case anyone else was still concerned about that. But then Rasheed Rice actually posted on his Instagram photos and videos of him working out down in Texas with Patrick Mahomes and company again. So... Um, it's at least good to see that Rashia Rice is back to normal everyday life and getting back to football even after everything that's been going on. He's working out with Patrick Mahomes and he's getting down there. Maybe not so much as visible as he was before on social media and stuff like that, even though he just posted himself. Um, but there wasn't too much from like Bobby Stroop or Patrick, like pictures and photos of Rishi Rice because I'm sure they're going to try to tone it back with that right now. But, hey, it's it's something positive, you know? Yeah, and I think that the whole Rishi Rice incident, it's definitely a learning moment. You'd like to be able to learn without something so costly, but uh, that Rishi Rice $1 million lawsuit, uh, that's about as much money as he's going to make this year and a little bit more money that he's going to make this year. And I don't think that that's going to end up going to court. They're probably going to settle out of court, but they're not going to settle cheap. I mean, this is all going to end the lawyer fees. So Rasheed Rice learned a very expensive lesson, and hopefully that financial loss is is enough for him to, I guess, get you know back on the right path. But it just it sucks that you know that's what it took, if that's what it takes, you know, for him to be you know not harming other people. But yeah, I mean, he's going to play on the team in 2024. I'm not super concerned about that. Even before Andy Reid spoke, I was never really concerned that he was going to get cut. But I mean, we're still waiting for NFL action. He can still get suspended, and he probably will get suspended. Well, and here's another thing, too, that I haven't noticed as many people talk about. So um, one of the people that uh, was in the car with Rasheed Rice or was involved in the accident, I should say, uh, Teddy Knox, he's a current wide receiver at SMU. That's how him and Rasheed Rice know each other. He's also named in the lawsuit against Rasheed Rice, and he's also being sued for millions of dollars. A guy like Teddy Knox doesn't have the kind of money that Rasheed Rice does. So, you know, it's even worse for a guy like him. And then I believe he's already been kicked off or suspended, I should say, from the SMU football team. Um, he doesn't quite have the resume of Rasheed Rice. You know, Rasheed Rice is a what well, we think he is a big part of the future of Kansas City and their offense and, you know, kind of that core group. So the Chiefs have incentive to keep him. Teddy Knox, I don't know too much about him, but, you know, he he's a college football player. He's not making professional football money. He's not a surefire professional football player. So for a guy like him, he may have just thrown away any opportunities he has now and in the future. Yeah. I mean, I mean NIL is something, but NIL money is not what's going to save him there. And like you said, he doesn't have the resume of a Rasheed Rice who just won a Super Bowl. So I, I definitely think that, you know, I mean, if anything, the situation is going to teach younger athletes that 
you know, might hang around more professional athletes or, or doing, you know, dumb stuff, dumb illegal things that, hey, you're going to pay not only the financial price, but you're going to pay the price of maybe being kicked off your college football team or maybe losing that NIL money. So uh, hopefully this kind of, uh, I guess, sparks other athletes to, you know, play it safer, I guess. Yeah, well, you would think that, and then we continue to get these incidents over and over again. And we had an incident last year with uh, one of the top picks in last year's draft, Jalen Carter, the defensive tackle out of Georgia. He was involved in some sort of racing incident uh, or car wreck that ended up in one of his teammates at Georgia dying, as well as a recruiting staffer. So it, you hope that at some point enough is enough and these guys start to understand and learn that you just can't do this type of stuff with cars or just, you know, especially as a professional athlete where a lot of people look up to you, but it just continues to happen over and over again. Yeah. And so hopefully and we talked about this in a previous stream. Hopefully the Chiefs next offseason can kind of avoid some of this controversy because between Tyree Kale and Rasheed Rice and, you know, all the contract, I could deal with a stress-free offseason where we're not worried about somebody ending up in major legal trouble. That would be nice. Yeah, it would be nice to not have to worry about someone getting suspended, someone getting arrested. Uh, it just doesn't need to happen. No. No. So we'll move on from that. That's kind of the weekly Rasheed Rice update. I want to talk about some stuff that Brett Veach talked about today in a press conference that he did on Zoom with uh, local media. So we got some tidbits from him, some, I think, notable stuff before we go into the draft. And one of the things he said, Michael, that I found interesting he kind of talked about the Canarius Tony and Sky Moore situations, which is something that a lot of, you know, they've kind of become polarizing figures among Chiefs fans. But Brett Beach came out and said that, uh, you know, they like Sky Moore and his mental toughness and how he's handled his situation so far. Uh, but then Canarius Tony, more specifically, who I wanted to talk about, Brett Beach, see, with the Sky Moore thing, Brett Beach just kind of, you know, so yeah, yeah, Sky Moore, we like his mentality, yada yada. With Kadarius Tony, he said that they still believe in him as a player that can help this team. Like he was very adamant that Kadarius Tony would have a role on this team next year. Everyone was quick to write him off after last year. Or I mean, yeah, they were quick to write him off, but I mean that more so in a sense of like people were pretty sure he just was not going to be on the team, that he was going to get cut. And he still could at some point. I remember we got a tweet from Ian Rappaport too prior to the Super Bowl saying that it was an uphill battle for Kadarius Tony to make the team next year. And that kind of checks out with, you know, his performance on the field. But, you know, I started to look at it more and more. And I never really talked about it too much on this podcast or on the channel, but. There's not really any financial benefit to cutting Kadarius Tony. He's cheap, and you know people are gonna hate me saying this at this point, but he's still got talent. We've seen what he can do before. I think Chiefs fans need to start accepting that Kadarius Tony is gonna be on this team next year. Uh, where do you land on that, Michael? I kind of feel like he was a player that if he didn't get cut at the beginning of the off season with MVS, he's going to be here because they would have just cleaned ship or cleaned house, I guess, and cut MVS and Kadarius Tony on the same date. They, they wouldn't wait around and see if Kadarius Tony is going to have a good training camp. I think he's going to be on this team in 2024. Now I'll probably get a lot of hate for saying this. He was really good, you know, in, in the season that he got traded to the chiefs and help them win the Super Bowl. Obviously, he had that major, I think it was a punt return, got him like the 10 yard line mm -hmm. in the Super Bowl, scored a touchdown in the Super Bowl. So he's got the talent. The problem is in 2020, I guess 2023, 2024, he got into his own head. He couldn't mm -hmm. catch the football. It resulted in a, a lot of interceptions and, you know, just drive killers. And while that does suck, and while I think that he needs to be on a, a shorter leash, I don't think that we've seen the end of Kadarius Tony playing decent football. I think he could flip the script and and turn the 
page, but it's going to take a, a lot of built up trust. It's going to take a lot of reps to get him back into it. And I think that you still need to be cautious with him because if if he opens up the 2024 season with an intercept or a dropped ball that ends in an interception, he needs to be benched immediately. Because at that point, you didn't learn anything or improve in any way. But I do think that you, you got to give him at least one more shot. And if he fails it at that point, you got to get rid of him. I like that you brought up MVS's name because he's kind of a comparison that I make to Canarius Tony heading into next year because I feel like one of the biggest reasons MVS was a major failure last year and he took a massive step back kind of like Canarius Tony was because he was asked to be playing a role that he wasn't best suited in. Canarius Tony, they talked him up as wide receiver one, Michael. We remember it. They were saying, hey, we, we believe this guy has wide receiver one potential. Uh, they got him a lot of targets early on, even though he had missed like all of training camp, they just kept going to him week one against the lions over and over again. He accumulated all those drops. They really loved him. And then I think they realized, Hey, maybe he's not so good in that role. And maybe Michael, we can get more of that Kadarius Tony that we got in 2023 after we traded for him and more of a complimentary role where he's not being asked to do all those things. He's not asked to be our wide receiver one. He's basically going to be a supercharged McCall Hardman that can return punts, that can get handoffs now and then. He can get him the ball in a screenplay, and every once in a while he'll, he'll give you positive yardage, you know? And I, I think that's m- what the Chiefs need to expect out of Kadarius Tony from now on, and I think if – I think it'd be best for all parties involved if Kadarius Tony became that for this team and he remained on the roster because, as I said, there's not really a ton of financial benefit to cutting Kadarius Tony. The penalties would be less if you did it next year if you let him go and don't pick up that fifth-year option, which they probably won't. Uh, with Sky Moore, because uh, I should talk about him just a little bit more, I don't know, man. I it depends on how many wide receivers they still bring in. They haven't brought in another veteran at this point. I wouldn't rule out that's still happening maybe after the draft or the Chiefs maybe drafting multiple receivers. And then if that does happen, the numbers get kind of tight. So what do you think? Listen, I, and maybe that's a problem that I have that I want to write off players too soon. I'm done with Sky Moore. Like, like <laughs> there's nothing that I'm going to see or that I believe that I'm going to see that's going to make me change my mind on Sky Moore. I think he is what he is. He He's done nothing. And, and I don't think he's even really worth having out there because, I mean, he's just out there getting cardio. We're, we're paying him a lot of money to go just run routes and, and not catch the football. So I'd rather find somebody that clicks better with Mahomes, that is a better wide receiver, quite frankly. And I, I think his time is probably done. You can't keep him on the roster – just because he was a second round draft pick because you probably overshot it. You definitely probably overshot it. He's probably, if if you were to redraft him now, he probably wouldn't go into the sixth or seventh round. Oh, he'd definitely be a day three pick. I feel like some, man, that that's tough to project. That's a tough hypothetical because a lot of people did like him in that pre-draft process. But the thing is, is he's a slot receiver with bad agility scores. He, in his uh, pre-draft testing, his RAS score, his agility was very bad. And for a slot receiver, that's supposed to be getting open very easily because uh, that's what a lot of people thought was one of his redeeming traits was that, you know, he can get open. He's got a nice release. Uh, that hasn't really translated at all. And he's really struggled to beat man coverage. And with Sky Moore in particular, I'm kind of with you where it's like, I don't know if I really need to see anything else. There's some people out there that are still adamant that if he were to play more of the slot, that he would succeed because the Chiefs tried to play him outside quite a bit last year. But the thing is, is that's where Rasheed Rice needs to go. And I think a lot of us already can see that Rasheed Rice is the better player than Sky Moore. So he'd just be taking snaps away from Rasheed Rice and the slot. And I just don't think there's a place for him on this team. Like sure. As a wide receiver five, you're not complaining, but I'm just saying that if we draft another receiver and then maybe even another after that, okay, it's Hollywood, Rasheed, two draft picks, let's just say. Justin Watson's probably going to be on this team. What is that, five or six wide receivers right there? They're not keeping seven again, I don't think. 
Um, no. So it's going to be a numbers game, and I don't know if Sky Moore is going to make it. We'll talk about that after the draft more probably once we see what the Chiefs do with that position group. But Sky Moore, I just don't see it with him. Uh, even the excuse that people make for him – you know, playing in the slot versus on the outside. It's been two straight years of just nothing from Sky Moore. And I just feel like once we've seen those two years, uh, because remember during the season, Michael, I was bringing up those stats and it was like a comparison to other receivers through as many career games as Sky Moore. Like Nikhil Harry was one. Nikhil Harry had like more yards and touchdowns than Sky Moore through like the first 20 games of his career. Nikhil Harry was, you know, an infamous bust. It's really hard to see Sky Moore come back from this. It's just it just hasn't worked out. And listen, I, I know there are some players that you can't write off because maybe they didn't get the opportunity, maybe they didn't have the you know chance to showcase their talent. There's nothing that I think Sky Moore hasn't had the opportunity to do. Like he's played, he's been not very good. And you're not going to find out that he's a magically better player by playing him more. You're just going to find out that he's still not good. So I, I don't know, man. I don't think he – I think he'll probably make the team. But even then, I, in training camp, if you do draft two wide receivers and it's between Kadarius Tony and Sky Moore, it, that's tough because of the politics of it. Like you did draft Sky Moore in the second round, but you also – you know, think Kadarius Tony has higher upsides, so who knows? But you know, his time in Kansas City might be numbered. I agree, man. I don't think there's too much else that I need to add to that. I just think that he hasn't shown enough. Like even with Kadarius Tony, how big of a disappointment he's been. He's shown in the past what he can do with the ball in his hands. He's we've seen good games from him. It's like every week last year, Michael, it's like, Oh, Sky Moore had two catches for 11 yards. Just nothing from the guy. And it's been that for two straight years. Now he had like one good game against the chargers his rookie year when there was nobody else left for Patrick Mahomes to throw the ball to. But that was about it. That's the highlight of his career. Yeah. And, and you could just find somebody else in the draft that can do his job better. And so, you know, why not do that? Yeah, I agree. All right. One more thing I want to talk about, and then we'll kind of get into our mock draft. We'll probably do one or two mock drafts, uh, depending on how much time we have. We'll see how the first one goes. Um, J.K. Dobbins, a running back that the Kansas City Chiefs had in on a free agent visit, ended up signing with the Los Angeles Chargers, whom he also visited earlier on. So he is now off the table for the Kansas City Chiefs. We don't have to spend too much time on this, Michael, but... Um, any thoughts on J.K. Dobbins being off the table for the Chiefs now? Listen, I, I don't love that he signed with the division rival, but at the same time, like I, I wasn't a huge J.K. Dobbins guy. I, I just think that his injury history is too much to overlook, and so I don't know how much he would have played, to be honest with you, but I, I definitely think that they could address the running back need in the draft, but – I'm not super disappointed with missing out on J.K. Dobbins. I think you could probably find somebody that can stay healthier. Uh, but I, I know, Josh, that you definitely thought that you know J.K. would be a good addition. I thought he could help. I thought he could help for sure, man. I mean, you look at the yards per carry number for his career and what he has been able to do when he's healthy. I would have liked him a whole hell of a lot better than CEH's RB2 because currently that's the reality. And I – said this when we saw the news that he was visiting Kansas city is he's kind of the last guy that's a veteran free agent that would actually move the needle at all for me. He's gone now. So the chiefs have kind of pigeonholed themselves into having to draft a running back relatively high in the draft. And when I say relatively high, that probably means like early day three, but you have to take one now in my opinion, like you have to, you cannot go into next year with your running back room being, Isaiah Pacheco and CEH. That's not good enough because then you're one injury away to, from Pacheco um, or you're one Pacheco injury away from CEH being your starting running back. And that scares the hell out of me. I don't like CEH. And I know some people have said, ah, he's fine as a backup. Eh, is he? He averaged 3.2 yards per carry last year. That's not very efficient. We've seen what happens when the Chiefs try to give him the ball more than a couple times in a game. He starts to kill drives. It's like he runs out of magic, and then all of a sudden he starts falling over for 
negative yardage on those second long runs. And it's like, all right, can we get someone else in there? And we've seen time and time again, the Chiefs have brought in these other running backs. I mean, you name them, Derek Gore, LaMichael P. Ryan in preseason last year, uh, Isaiah Pacheco when he was a rookie. It's just like they brought in so many guys and all of them have flashed more than CEH to me. And then yet he just continues to get these opportunities. I don't get it. I don't understand it. We don't have to go off in this whole tangent again because you guys know how I feel about CEH. I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way, but he cannot be your RB2 next year or else something went wrong. Yeah. I just had a weird flashback thought. If Damian Williams didn't – he didn't retire, but if he didn't take that COVID year off, I wonder if the Chiefs would have even drafted Clyde. Oh, I think they would have probably still. Um, but it definitely sucks what happened to Damian Williams because I felt like – because he planned on coming back the next year, and I felt like he could have helped us. And the Chiefs were just like, nah. I, th- I think if I remember at the time, they were in a bidding war with the Niners for Trent Williams, and they were trying to find more money, and Damian Williams saved them a few million dollars, so they went ahead and cut him. But that makes me sad because I really liked him. I thought he could have helped. But all right, we got all the news out of the way. I think it's time, Michael, to start our Kingdom crew mock draft i know you're not too um brushed up on most of the prospects in this draft and i've definitely been a little bit behind this year i have a pretty good idea especially in the earlier rounds but michael here's the thing you see all these mock drafts from all these experts and yeah i'm sure they're experts on um the prospects in the draft and look this is not knocking those guys in any way because it's extremely hard what they do and it's extremely hard for them to know all these teams but michael what you have over these draft analysts and what i have over these draft analysts is knowledge of the kansas city Chiefs. we know what the chiefs need i've seen some crazy mocks even from some of these experts where they have us taken like a cornerback in round one and i just don't see that happening whatsoever so even though michael you might not feel as comfortable um with your knowledge on a lot of these guys, you know what we need. And I feel like that's enough for us to conduct a pretty decent mock draft here. So yeah, I will share my screen and we will get started on our 2024 Kansas city chiefs mock draft. Like I said, depending on how fast this goes, maybe we'll do like a second one. We'll kind of play around a little bit. There is trades in this one. Um, I don't know if we'll do any, we'll just kind of see what comes up. Uh, and some of the draft analysts that I've seen have had the Chiefs trading up. Like there was one guy that had the Chiefs trading up with Jacksonville to draft Xavier Worthy, as if Xavier Worthy is going to go in the top twenty. That's ridiculous to me. If you're trading, if you're trading up, it's got to be because someone, one of those like top three or four guys, fell to a spot that they were not supposed to fall to. Um. I've seen a lot of smoke as of recently uh, about us dra- or drafting an offensive tackle early in this one, or maybe even trading up for an offensive tackle. Um, Andy Reid also talked about offensive tackle potentially in round one. But, man, to me, it's like to spend another top 100 pick on offensive tackle, I don't – like I'm so split. Like I wouldn't be upset, man, if they could get someone really good. But I'm not like itching to draft another offensive tackle, another left tackle – with our first round pick because I'm not, I haven't given up on Wanya Morris yet. He was a rookie last year. I still think he can help. And if you brought back a veteran such as Donovan Smith and then had Wanya Morris maybe take another step next year, would that not be okay? I don't understand the desperation that some other people have for the Chiefs to draft a left tackle in the first couple of picks. Um, Where do you kind of stand on left tackle? I don't love the idea of a left tackle in the first round just because from what I've seen, if it's not Joe Alt or a few other guys, there's not yeah, going to be anybody. Not, yeah. Yeah. It's, that, 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 I also don't think it's as big of a need as wide receiver. You need wide receiver more than a left tackle. I know that sounds crazy, but I agree. I, I think I think you're just fine with Wanya Morris or guess what? Donovan Smith's still a free agent. You bring him back after the draft and you're fine. Mm-hmm. I agree. I, I just I, I don't think we need to go overkill. That's not to say that you couldn't draft a tackle still in this draft, but maybe you can find better value at the second round pick or the third round pick. Like Patrick Paul out of Houston, a lot of people like 
he'd yeah. be a reach at 32, but get down to 64 and he's still there. Oh, sure. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. I think I actually did mock um, Patrick Paul being our second round uh, tackle pick for, for a bleacher report stream because you know he has the size and strength at, uh, you know, uh, if he's in the second round, I feel comfortable with it, but I think that we're both in agreement that the chiefs are going to need a wide receiver in round one. I'm looking at, you know, apparently the Raiders got Penix. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, Bo Nix to the Vikings. Wow. Um, well, some names that I know and some names that I've studied up on, Adonai Mitchell and Xavier Worthy. I would, I'd be furious if the Chiefs took Xavier Worthy, but I really do like Mitchell. I think Mitchell is a solid wide receiver, um, could fit in this offense. He's just a better overall pass catcher than Worthy is. That's why when I saw somebody suggest that the Chiefs trade up to get Worthy, listen, I know that Worthy can fly. I know that he's a speedster, but the Chiefs have not had great luck drafting speedsters as of late. So I'd be okay drafting the more surefire guy, and I think that guy is Mitchell. But like Lad McConkey from Georgia, I know he's a popular name. Um, let's see who else is a wide receiver that. Can, uh... Well, real quick before uh, you uh, say that. I've kind of swayed back the other way in the Xavier Worthy versus Adonai Mitchell debate because I wouldn't be upset with Xavier Worthy. I just think a lot of people, I think a lot of people have decided that he sucks all of a sudden because of what he weighed in at at the combine. I totally understand the weight concerns. I do. I really do. Um, but I don't think that's his game day weight. And I know a lot of people have backed off because it's like he's getting all this, oh, next Tyreek Hill type, and that just pushes people away. And Xavier Worthy would definitely be a move that's more so for next year because that's basically your Hollywood Brown replacement if you don't keep Hollywood Brown. Could Xavier Worthy help you as a rookie? Sure, but he's not necessarily the best fit considering what you already have. I have some concerns about Adonai Mitchell, though. He has the prototype, size, speed, everything you would want for an X receiver. But his advanced metrics that I've started to dig into are not very good. I saw a tweet the other day on Twitter. Um, and this is from Scott Barnett, DFB. He says all round one wide receivers to average less than 85 yards per game in best college season uh, in the last 10 years. Here are the names. John Ross, Brashad Perryman, Jalen Rieger, Quentin Johnston, Kelvin Benjamin, Calvin Ridley, Philip Dorsett, Henry Ruggs, Adonai Mitchell. That's the list. Those are the first round receivers or um, was that first round? Um, let me read the tweet again. Yeah. All round one wide receivers to average less than 85 yards per game in their college, their best college season. Not great. That's a lot of busts on that list that I just read, Michael. There was one guy, Calvin Ridley. Besides that, I mean, uh, I don't want any of those guys. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, that's definitely a concern. I, I think my concern with Worthy is just, I mean, you mentioned John Ross. I I see the John Ross comp uh, with Worthy because, you know, go, I mean, back in 2017, I don't want to say the main reason that Ross got drafted so high, but one of the main reasons he got drafted so high was because he could fly. And I don't want the Chiefs making that mistake. And I'm just looking back at, you know, previous mistakes the Chiefs have made, like with Amico Hardman, it, it's that the speedy receiver is not always the best wide receiver. And so I, I don't want the Chiefs to fall in that trap. Yeah, I, and I understand that too. Um, out of the guys that are available here, though, if we're going to go receiver, it looks like our options are Adonai Mitchell, Xavier Worthy, Keon Coleman, you can maybe take Lad McConkey. Lad McConkey seems like a safe pick, you know, with all of our concerns and everything like that. I I'm a fan of Lad McConkey. I just think he's a guy that's going to play in the league for a really long time, and he's a master at getting open. You've seen the footwork videos with him. Um, good athlete too. The size is a little bit of a concern with him too. Arm length is a little bit scary with him, but I mean, I feel like a lot of people feel like he's going to be a solid pro. Yeah. Um. Honestly, they have him. I, I will... go, go ahead. ahead. No, you're good. Go I was, ahead. 
I was gonna say I don't I, I wouldn't hate taking worthy if we if we try it. I mean, look, we could always double up on wide receiver later on. Um there's also Darius Robinson. I took him in a mock draft that I did yesterday, the Missouri defensive lineman, bias aside, he would uh be a spagsy pick, he would be a Chiefs type of pick. Um, I'd be kind of surprised that they went defensive line in round one, even if he was there, but, um, he fits the spags mold of a guy that can play inside and out, um, kind of a mini Chris Jones. He's a true one through nine tech who doesn't have the best athleticism, but he's very elite for a defensive tackle. And he can, he can do those occasional snaps out at edge like Chris Jones does. And that kind of kills two birds with one stone because we know that Charles and Menahue is going to be missing some time next year that she's probably need to draft another edge. And then defensive tackle we know is a position that's really lacking behind Chris Jones. So um, thought I'd throw his name in there. We'll probably still end up with a receiver here, but anything you want to add, Michael? No, no, I think that that's, that's solid. So I, don't, I feel like right now it's kind of between Xavier Worthy or Lad McConkey. Uh, honestly, let's go with Worthy. All right, we'll 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 try Xavier Worthy. I'm sure some people in the comments are going to be screaming at us for going with him instead of Adonai Mitchell. But uh, can we agree that Xavier Worthy seems like a cheese pick, though? Yeah, he definitely does. McConkey went see, to the Giants, and I feel better about Xavier Worthy as a pro prospect because he can actually get open on all three levels of the field. Unlike McCall Hardman or even, uh, well, um, there's another name or John Ross, uh, whenever he was coming out. So I, I still, I, I, I think, I think people are go, becoming too low on Xavier worthy. I still think he's going to be good. Do you like this trade that the Cardinals are offering us? I love that two spots down and a fourth rounder in the next year's draft. I'll take that. All right, well, let's do it. Probably make the next decision a little bit easier. Um, uh, We'll do one trade. That was our one trade there. Um, and look, Jeremiah Trotter Jr., a linebacker. That's not a position we're targeting. And Chris Braswell, the edge from Alabama, went. So uh, I think that worked out for us. Okay, so we addressed wide receiver. Um, I'm curious what other wide receivers are still actually up there. Um, Roman Wilson, Ricky Pearsall from Florida. I really like him. There's Devontae Walker from North Carolina. Um, so there's still some good players up on the board, but um, do, do you want to get frisky, Michael, and take another receiver, or are we looking at something else here? Who you like? There's Michael Hall, the defensive tackle junior, or the, Michael Hall Jr., the defensive tackle from Ohio State. He actually visited the Chiefs, so we know that they're interested in him. Kamari Lasseter, the Georgia cornerback, uh, would be kind of a – neat value pick right here, but we yeah. don't need a cornerback super high. Then there's Braden Fisk, uh, the defensive tackle from Florida state. He was an athletic monster in the pre-draft process. So who, who do you like here? Who, who's standing out to you? What are the tackles looking like right now? We got, uh, the Washington offensive tackle. We got the Yale offensive tackle. Both of those are prospects I've seen linked to the Chiefs a couple times, but they seem like rich picks at this draft spot. We could try to trade back. We could propose a trade back, maybe move back to like 78 with the commanders or something if you want to try it. I feel like we maybe need like a tackle. I think we could pass on a tackle. There's nobody there that really you know, screams, you know, draft. Um, I wouldn't hate. Honestly, I would not hate Lassiter. I, I wouldn't hate Lassiter, but I also wouldn't hate maybe another wide receiver. That's kind of what I'm thinking. I'm I'm thinking defensive tackle or wide receiver again right here, um, because there is a lot of talent still available here. We got Roman Wilson, Ricky Pearsall, Jalen McMillan, Tez Walker, Johnny Wilson, um. Do you have a favorite out of those guys? Um, Walker and Wilson are, are solid. I know you're a Pearsall guy. I um, am. I mean, I like Jalen McMahon. I like all. I like all the Washington receivers too. I like Jalen McMillan yeah. as well. So McMillan would be solid because I mean he played with Penix and 
that offense was maybe the best passing offense in college football. So, yeah. Uh, there's Jermaine Burton, the Alabama wide receiver. He'd be a little bit of a high. He's been rising a little bit though. Uh, his his route chart. Uh, he succeeded on just about every single route in college. Um, he was in the green, so he can get open uh, at all levels of the field as well. Super fast. A little bit of off-field concerns with him, and I feel like maybe the Chiefs should kind of back off on guys with off-field concerns at the moment. Um, Try to, at least. Yeah, there's defensive tackle. I feel like we could address another need right here. Michael Hall Jr., the defensive tackle from Ohio state. He might be kind of the smart pick here as much as I would like to get a receiver. And there's other receivers still that we could, we could come across later, like Javon Baker from UCF or Brendan Rice from USC. I'm kind of thinking defensive yeah. tackle. I, I don't hate it. I think it's probably a smarter pick just to go back to back wide receivers. Probably not the best idea. So yeah, I'd be good with a defensive tackle. Yeah, let's do it. It addresses a need. Yeah. All right. Pretty solid so far. I like what we've done. All right. Here we are with our third round pick. I don't like any of those trades. No. All right. So Jatavion Sanders, the tight end from Texas is up there. Uh, the Yale tackle. Now here at this spot, I wouldn't hate that. Um, a lot of people like this guy. I have concerns about the level of competition, but um from the tape that I've seen of, and I'm not even going to try to announce or pronounce his name. Uh, very powerful offensive tackle. He's got great size, 6'5", 320 pounds. Um, and we know that Andy Reed loves his, or no, the, I'm thinking of the BYU guy. Uh, this is the Yale guy. But again, everything I said still stands. There's also Dominic Pooney, your guy from Kansas. And he could be yeah. kind of the, uh, it, so, I don't know how you feel about him playing tackle. I know he played tackle at Kansas. I don't know if people see him as a tackle at the pro level, but he may be one of those guys that can play tackle in a pinch and uh, maybe take over for Joe Tooney or Trey Smith after those guys walk in the future. I, I really like Pooney, uh, obviously being a Kansas guy. Uh, so the bias aside, he's not a tackle at the next level. Uh, so I, I do think he's probably going to be – uh, probably going to be a guard at the next level, which is fine, but the Chiefs don't really need a guard. Um, I mean, shoot, I don't I don't hate the Sanders pick either, but I think that the smarter pick would probably be to get a defensive or a defensive a tackle because you could use some depth. Um, yeah. Honestly, though, like with the Yale tackle being there, it is more of a game because at least with Pooney, he's played Big Twelve and and now SEC competition, so I feel better in that aspect. But you know, maybe the Yale guys better. I, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe a higher I, the potential to play offensive tackle. You know, start at offensive tackle. Yeah. <sighs> hmm. Yeah, I think we we, we should probably. Again, stick with what we need and a guy that fits kind of the profile we're looking for here. You just want to go ahead and take the Yale tackle? Yeah, I think it'd be a good fit. All right, let's do it. Dominic Pooney is still there. Does he make it to our next pick? No, he went off the board. I would have I would have definitely taken him at 131 if he was still there. Just bulk up on offensive line. Um, yeah. Okay, so we've kind of addressed the top three concerns. Now is where I would look for like a running back or um, maybe we could look at a second wide receiver, Bucky Irving, the running back from Oregon's there. I don't really like, yeah, see, look at the Raz. That's see, and he's five, nine too. This is CEH all over again to me. This scream CEH undersized and unathletic. No, thank you. But Ray Davis, the Kentucky running back, I want to say he was second or third in the SEC in rushing last year. I like him. You have Brendan Rice, um, related to Jerry Rice, wide receiver from USC. He's got a lot of good speed. He's there. He'd be interesting here. We got um, the cornerback from Florida State, Jerry and Jones. Um, hmm. 
wide receiver Javon Baker from UCF. A lot of people are really starting to like him here late in the process. He was a monster at UCF. Um, really like hit the fluidity in his movement from what I've seen. So uh, anybody stand out to you here? Let's see. We're in round four. Um, yes. See, I think I think a running back is definitely like a running back is a good option, but I think you could probably find a running back. I think in we can round wait five or six. Yeah, I think you could wait. I wouldn't hate grabbing a corner. Let's see who's up there. Johnny Dixon from Penn State. Uh there's only a couple of guys that would even make sense at this pick. Jerry and Jones from Florida State. And we do know that Veach can find defensive backs late in the draft. So if we're thinking like Veach right here, we could even wait a little bit longer for a corner. Um, I wide really... Receiver. Wide receivers, we got Brendan Rice, son of Jerry Rice, I believe. We have... Jacob Cowing from Arizona. We have Javon Baker from UCF. I'm I'm on the Javon Baker train. I really like him. Um, and then I also really like maybe even grabbing who did, who was it that I saw? I mean, shoot, yeah, we could we could even take the Florida State cornerback here too. I'd be okay with that. He's got a I good like athletic I profile. I feel like I've watched. Um, the UCF receiver play. You like, probably I like have. But I think I, yeah. So I wouldn't hate that. Should we do it? I, I, I would yeah. love it, honestly. I've taken them too many times probably doing these mock drafts, but um, there's also Brendan Rice. But I, I think, oh man, between, I, I we'll go Javon Baker. How does that sound? Yeah. Let's do it. Double up on wide receiver. I love it. I love it. You come out Most, of this uh, with that. Wide receiver hall? Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, my guy Isaac Arendo from Louisville went off the board at running back. But that's okay. Oh, we had the South Dakota State running back, Isaiah Davis. I really like him from what I've seen. Um, cornerback. We have Daquan Hardy from Penn State. Elijah Jones from Boston College. I feel like I've seen his name a few times. Jarvis Brownlee from Louisville. That could work. Maybe a little bit of a would you take here. a corner over would you take a corner over running back here? I like what we have on the board at running back, honestly. And then we have pick 173. We could take a corner back there. I say we take what we think we like at running back now and then wait okay. till that next pick to take a corner. That's that's how I would do this. There's Blake Watson from Memphis, too. We could also even wait for him. Ah oh, man, this what is tough. running back. What running back sticks out to you? Isaiah Davis from South Dakota State. And then, um, shoot, Javon Foster, the offensive tackle from Missouri is there. If we didn't take a tackle earlier, he would have been a really nice pick here. Um, but Blake Watson from Memphis, too. So Memphis has quietly put out some pretty good running backs over the past several years. And Blake Watson is just another guy that they produced. I remember when he played Missouri last year, he was really killing us. He can also receive out of the backfield very well, and he's got good speed. So that sounds good to me. Um, he'd probably be available at the next pick. So I don't know. I like um, I would at cornerback. Like Kenny, Kenny Logan's a pretty good safety, but he's uh, pro he'll probably be there in the seventh too. Yeah, we could take another late round DB if he's there. I I like. Uh, I like Jarvis Brownlee, the cornerback from Louisville, if we're going to go corner. And then if we're going to go running back, I like Isaiah Davis from South Dakota State. Do you think we'd uh, – cornerback or running – honestly, let's go running back just because with Clyde back and Pacheco's injury. Okay, yeah, you sold me. You sold me, yeah. I, get Clyde off the field. Yeah, you sold me. Let's do it. Yeah, Isaiah Davis, I like that pick. All right, let's see. It looks like cornerback Jarvis Brownlee from Louisville is still there. Okay, I, I think I'm running the podium with his name on it, unless you have any other suggestions from what you see over here. 
No, I'd be, I'd be good with that. There's also okay. Eric All, the Iowa tight end. Iowa tight ends are always safe picks. Yeah, I don't love the idea of investing in a seventh round tight end, though. I feel like that's something that you kind of need to get earlier. More in the fifth still, so we got a little bit. But I get what you're saying. Tip Reeman from Illinois, though. A lot of people like him, and I took him in my mock draft last night. 6'4", 271, 9.9 Raz. Um, that would be interesting. I think I'm going to go ahead and take the cornerback, though. Uh, is there Let's any argument from you there? Because, I mean, that addresses a need as well. Yeah. That's really what we've done in this draft is attack the needs. All right. Round seven. Believe this is our last pick. Yeah. So Joe Milton's on the board, the quarterback from Tennessee. Brett Beach actually did talk about how they may look at quarterback prospects a little bit more close this year. Um, I see Miles Cole up there, the edge from Texas Tech. A lot of people love getting him in the late rounds. He's got a good athletic profile, 6'6, 278. Um he was productive at Texas Tech. You got Carson Steele, the UCLA running back, who also met with the Chiefs. Um, at this point in the draft, man, hey, you're just kind of looking at best player available. But anybody else yeah. that sticks out to you? Miles Cole would probably be a good pick. Yeah, I, I just don't think they double up on running back, especially like day three running backs. Um, you're definitely so going to want a guy that can contribute. So, I mean – if they took another running back, because, I mean, you're probably going to want to. I would love if they had drafted two running backs, if they're not going to sign a veteran, because at this point I'm just assuming they're not going to sign a veteran because I don't know who else there is to sign. I mean, maybe you bring back McKinnon, but it doesn't seem like he can make it through a season anymore. He might retire. He might. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens with him, but I wouldn't operate under the belief that Jared McKinnon is going to come back. I would operate under the belief that, you have Pacheco, a rookie, and Clyde. And that room is a little bit shaky. We have Carson Steele available here, who we know has met with the Chiefs. He also gives you some good size at six foot, 228 pounds. So what do you think? Um, you know what? Why not? All right, we'll do it. I really like Miles Cole, but eh. Well, it seems like people always take him in these. We'll go Carson Steele. I think I took him yesterday too, but I wouldn't complain if we brought in two running backs. If you carry three, hey, you could have two rookies and I'd be okay with that just because, you know, I feel like both of them give you higher upside than CEH. And CEH, if he happens to stick around or you keep four, he's a break glass in case of emergency type of guy. But overall, Michael... I think this is a very, very high upside draft that we came out with. Yeah, I think you addressed every need. I mean, maybe you didn't get a defensive end, but the defensive ends at the spot of value. Okay. There. Yeah, they're okay. There's still some veterans you could sign there too um, after the draft. I feel like we'll see some movement in free agency after the draft once the Chiefs kind of understand what their weaknesses still are if they weren't able to grab a guy that they liked at a certain position. But yeah, I mean, we got wide receiver, defensive tackle, offensive tackle in the first three picks. That's ideal. Then we were able to get Javon Baker, everyone's draft darling here uh, late in the process. Got a guy we think can emerge at running back, address cornerback after a sneeze departure, double up on running back. And we got that fourth round pick from Arizona in that trade. So I, I think that was pretty good. Yeah. I kind of forgot and, about that trade. Yeah, there. I mean, just stacking assets for next year. But I think that should do it. We're at about an hour. I won't do another mock draft, and I feel like that was a good one. Um, so we'll go ahead and end it there, guys. Hopefully you had fun with this episode, as much fun as we did. Um, make sure you like, share, and subscribe so more Chiefs fans can find this. Make sure you check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all those good platforms. Uh, but before we sign off, Michael, where can the people find you? You guys can find me on YouTube at KC Sports Report, on social media at the Michael Darcy, and go check me out on the Bleacher Report mobile app. It's just Michael underscore Darcy. There you guys have it, and that will be in the description. As always, make sure you check all that out. You can check out my stuff on showmefootball.com, arrowheadaddict.com for more. But with all that being said, we will see you all in the next one.
Go Chiefs.